And hi, everyone. Good to be here again. Uh, Eve will be here two Wednesdays in a row, the next two Wednesdays. And then we're going to pretty much steadily leapfrog it after that. So that's for now the rhythm, in case that matters. <laughs> and, uh, I do also, it dawned on me today that I haven't offered Feeding Your Demons in a while. So maybe the next, I'll talk to Noam and everyone on the team and uh, maybe the next time I come around, you know, in three weeks, we can do a Feeding Your Demons session. Usually I like to give people uh, a heads up. <laughs> I, I could have sprung it on you tonight, but not with that practice. That, that practice I want people to know at a time that's what they're coming for. It's uh, rich and wonderful, but it's also something that uh, can be, you know, something you want to think about before you, you join in terms of what you might want to work with and so on. It's also something that can be done spontaneously. And sometimes it's great to get thrown in the deep end without too much foresight. <laughs> in any case, here we are, January 19th. And I hope everyone is healthy and feeling good and feeling the at least uh, good that we can all be here tonight together. And gr I'm grateful for it. And gratitude is, as my mom always says, the greater attitude. And uh, it's a, also, I was hearing on NPR, uh, one of the ingredients for a, a long, healthy life. <laughs> so I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for, you know, being able to be together despite circumstances. And of course, grateful to the Buddha for teaching what he taught and for all those teachers who have kept the oral lineage alive and passed on the wisdom teachings throughout the millennia. And here we are, a part of the Sangha that consists of an unbroken thread. So I hope that that uh, resonates with you in the way that it does with me. It's actually quite phenomenal. Uh, my my ex-husband, Scott, uh, says that, you know, things like this or like Dharma, but like Chinese medicine you know, that, that may not have modern day scientific studies behind them, or now they do, but even, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, they didn't. But things that uh, persist the test of time uh, have something, right? That's, they wouldn't have persisted. They wouldn't have survived. They would have gone out of fashion or out of utility. And the Dharma certainly has tested, uh, has passed the test of time. And we are benefiting from it. And we even have scientific studies that prove it now. <laughs> so I am grateful for the Dharma and the Sangha, which is you. And of course, the Buddha, the teacher. So what I thought we would do tonight is to do some Donglen. So I'll guide us in a compassion practice of sending and receiving, uh, similar to metta, loving kindness, but with a little bit more maybe turbo boost in it, <laughs> a little more edginess. So we will move through the four phases of, of Tonglen after we do some settling the, the body, speech, and mind in the nat natural state with some conscious breathing and relaxation. We'll sit for about a half an hour tonight. And then we'll dive into enthusiastic effort or joyful enthusiasm, as Matthew Ricard translates it. I think there's some really fun and even a funny passage in here that I'm looking forward to discussing with you all after we meditate. And so let's go ahead and find a comfortable seat, either upright or lying down. Begin by letting the eyes close and come into your kind of Pavlovian response facilitated by your physical position not slouching, not being swallowed by your couch like you do when you're watching TV, but sitting upright. Even letting, if you're upright, letting your pelvis tilt to forward a little bit so that there's a nice S curve through the spine, an inward curve at the lumbar, an outward curve at the thoracics, and then again, an inward curve at the cervical spine, this S curve, which helps to distribute the weight of our body evenly and aligned with gravity so that we don't have to effort. 
The shoulders relax down the back, the chin drawn in slightly towards the throat, lengthening the back of the neck and creating space at the base of the skull. Feel an upward lift through the crown of the head and draw the chin towards the throat and then the tongue slightly in and up at the upper palate, at the root of the top front teeth. Relax the lower molars away from the upper molars. Let the jaw slacken. Relaxing the muscles of the face. Feel tension melting down towards the earth. The chest is slightly lifted, the belly soft and receiving the breath as it flows in and out of the body in a natural way. Feel your whole belt line, the front, side, and back body around the waist loose. The hips, the legs relaxed in a comfortable position. Feet are either underneath you in a crossed or in a cross position or flat on the floor, square, making contact with the earth. Arousing your motivation for your practice. This is the bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening for the benefit of oneself and others, called the twofold benefit self and other. You fold into that arousing of bodhicitta, the wish to wake up, to be a benefit in the world, also. Infusing it with a feeling of gratitude for this earth, the air, the water. The natural world, as well as your teachers, your sangha, and the dharma. We take refuge in these three jewels of the Buddha who taught the Dharma, his teaching, and the Sangha, the community of like-minded practitioners on the path, as well as our family tree, our ancestors, and all those who have passed on wisdom to us. Letting the heart open in recognition and a sense of gratitude for those who've cared for the earth before us and lived in these lands. Now let's more consciously Bring our awareness to the breath, this life-giving miracle. And drink it in with the in-breath, offer it up, pour it out with the out-breath. Releasing tension as you release the breath out. Allow the body to settle in its natural state, aligned with gravity, still like a mountain. Like a mountain, your body is at ease within itself, not tense, not contriving anything, a natural 
ease and balance, suffusing your being as much as possible. Find that. Remembering that just like the air and the space around you and the mountains and the trees and the water, your body is made up of 99.99% space. So feel that space pervading you, vibrating within you, and let that Ignite within you a feeling of spaciousness. Each breath suffusing your being with this quality of space. An opening to that truth that is already there. That naturally imbues the mind with a feeling, a quality of spaciousness. Settling the speech in its natural state, of course, has to do with speech and silence, not talking, but also they say not even reciting mantras or prayers. They say rest quietly like a lute with its strings cut through. And also on a subtle body level, on an energetic level, the breath is linked with the speech. And the prana is linked with the breath. So settling the speech in its natural state also means letting the prana and the breath find their natural rhythm. not forcing, not prolonging. If the breath is shallow, let it be shallow. If the breath is deep, let it be deep, and so on. Settling the mind in its natural state. Said to be resting vast like the sky, spacious, open, unbound, free of center and periphery. The natural state of the mind is spacious and luminous. Luminous in the sense of illuminated by cognizant awareness, like the light of the sun pervading that space of the mind. And thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, and so on arise and pass within that space like clouds arising and passing within the sky. Thoughts are not a problem, just like clouds are not a problem for the sky. They just arise, play themselves out and pass. And like the sky we observe, we hold the space, maintain awareness of the domain of the mind. 
without losing that natural clarity and luminosity. And if you've lost it, it's just like a cloud passing over the sun. Not a problem. Rest in the vantage point of awareness rather than fused with thought. Feeling is like sitting back a bit, broadening your perspective. Resting from that broad, open vantage point of awareness rather than the myopic tunnel vision fused with the reruns of the thoughts that come and go. We'll rest like this for about five minutes in silence, settling the body, speech and mind in their natural state. The eyes can either be closed or open as you wish.
feel as we transition into the Tonglen compassion practice that that luminous nature of mind can kind of converges or is most potent and concentrated at the heart chakra, the center of the sternum, right within the central channel, within the lotus heart chakra, blooming. And within that heart chakra is this warmth, the light of awareness. And imagine it like an orb of light, the size of a, you could say, grapefruit. It's and this orb of light, this nature of your own mind, this awareness is indestructible. Vajra-like, adamantine nature of mind beyond birth, death, may be clouded over, sullied by external karmic circumstances, but it itself is never changed or never broken. And it is with that orb of light, this feeling of our luminous nature, that we practice Tonglen, this is your bodhicitta, this profound ultimate nature of mind manifesting as compassion, love. It's what we all share. It's what we all have in common. And so take a few moments breathing in and out directly from that heart space as if you could br breathe directly into the heart, so 360 degrees around, above and below, aerating that luminous orb of light with the in-breath and exhale from the heart directly, 360 degrees, feeling that luminosity spreading throughout your body and beyond the pores. So this just breathing, feeling, inhale, directly into the heart space, exhale, directly from the heart space, aerating, enlivening, habituating your mind to rest in that heart chakra, feeling that golden orb of light there, an infinite source of light, power, wisdom, love. And also working with texture. So with the Donglen, we imagine that we're breathing in that which we would normally push away. So we work with a texture of like a dark, smoky vapor. We're breathing it into the heart where it evaporates as it hits the light of the sun at your heart. And then breathing out a cool, clear, healing light, a transformed energy. Just feel the texture of breathing in, habituating, familiarizing yourself with the breathing in of a, like a smoky vapor, transforming it at the heart space and breathing out a cooling, clearing, healing light. And then hook on to that rhythm, some personal Tonglen, self Tonglen. Check in and feel, are there any aspects of your subtle, emotional, mental body, physical body that have been exiled or judged or tormented or in pain in some way? And feel what that is. And with the next in-breath, Imagine that you're bringing that into the heart space in the form of that smoky vapor, welcoming it into the heart, and then exhaling, 
allowing it to be there in the heart space. So it's like you're opening the more spaciousness with the out breath. This cool release of energy throughout the body mind. Again, with each in breath, you're drawing it in to the heart. With the out breath, you're releasing the resistance, the separation, the judgment, and letting that live in you. It's like you're welcoming it home. Breathing in that which the parts of yourself that you would normally push away. And then with the out breath, feeling that quality of allowance and release and breathing out a cool, clear, feeling like you're offering a remedy or medicine, an antidote to that ailment. Just take about 10 breaths with that, the self dongmen. We'll gently shift to focusing toward another with this Tonglen breathing and visualization. The next step after self Tonglen is to imagine a loved one, someone toward whom it's quite easy and natural to feel affection and care for. Perhaps someone who's been going through hardship, illness, emotional pain. Maybe an estranged family member whom you really love, but you disagree with, you can imagine them. Any loved one, but be specific and choose one person and imagine them in front of you. Seeing them like you saw them last. What are they wearing? The look on their face. Imagine whatever is ailing them, surrounding them like a dark, smoky cloud. And with a sincere wish of in any way being able to help alleviate their burden. With the in-breath, drawing in the breath in the form of the dark, smoky vapor right directly into your heart. A luminous orb of light purifies, evaporates, transforms that cloud into a healing antidote. You breathe out with the out-breath in the form of a clear, luminous light surrounding, permeating them. The in-breath is drawing in whatever suffering they may experience in the form of the dark, smoky vapor. Transform it at your heart and then breathing out the cool, clear breeze or light of the remedy, whatever you intuitively feel may help them. Do 10 breaths like this.
last couple breaths, imagine what they'd look like completely free of their burden. Sparkle in their eye, perhaps a smile on their face. A lightening of their load. Let me wish that for them. May it be so. And then now shifting to a so-called neutral person, someone you might not know very well, maybe someone you see in your neighborhood or in the marketplace. It might not be easy to find someone like that, but someone towards whom you don't have a strong positive or negative emotional charge or connection. Most of the people on the planet are these neutral people we just don't know. So cultivating compassion for people we don't know, for neutral people in our lives can be very helpful. A male person, perhaps. Someone in a store in your neighborhood. Think of a neutral person in your life that you come into contact with, see them as clearly as you can. And again, intuitively, you may not know them and know what burdens they carry, but you may have an intuitive sense that perhaps they're tired or have physical pain or hardship of some kind. See that in the form of a smoky vapor and draw it into the heart space with the in-breath, transform it and send out a remedy, a cool healing light, recognizing that just like you, they wish to be free of suffering. And in some way, may I be of benefit to this person I don't even know. Ten breaths. them in their full flourishings, sparkle in their eyes, spring in their step, complete lightning of any burden they may carry. At least see that. May it be so. Now we shift to a challenging person. So we've been building our way up to this capacity now to bring to mind someone toward whom we might feel animosity or resentment, anger, someone who presses our buttons. Bring them to mind as clearly as you can, seeing what they looked like the last time perhaps that you saw them. See them in front of you and whatever confusion, delusion, burden, 
affliction they carry, you see that surrounding them like a smoke. And with the in-breath, recognizing that like you, they wish to be free of suffering. Explore and feel, what would it feel like if I had the courage to draw that suffering into my heart space, that indestructible nature of mind? Transform it and then send out, offer a cool, clear, healing, breeze, antidote, remedy, surrounding and each breath drawing in the smoke, each out breath blowing that smoke and offering the remedy, clearing their energy, bringing relief from suffering. Ten breaths like this. You might think, I can't do it, but just try a little breath, try a little bit, a little smoke. And notice how it feels. And don't take it literally. You're not taking on the suffering of others. You're just imagining what would it be like to capacitate myself to open to receiving it and sending out a remedy. A light touch, if needed. Next few breaths, really see this person rising up in their full glory, their full flourishing. Wish that for them. Make an internal prayer. We'll end with a few moments of extending this Tonglen to all beings everywhere. You may even imagine that you're up on the moon looking down at the earth, breathing in the suffering of the world, transforming it, breathing out. A clear, cool breeze of cleansing and love, and balance, wholeness, peace. even go as far as to feel what would it be like if we were all liberated from our suffering, liberated from confusion, liberated from oppression, illusion, separation. And what if all beings with the out-breath experienced the awakening to their true nature
Let's bring our hands together at our heart in prayer, if you wish, dedicating any positive energy of our collective practice for the collective good, spreading out, filling all of space, this good energy flowing, and multiplying infinitely as we offer it up. Emaho, how wonderful. Emaho is uh, one of the Tibetan phrases often used at the end of a text, a Dharma text, is like, Emaho, how wonderful. Keho, how marvelous. Okay, here we are, coming back. Questions, comments, observations, the Tonglen. Some of you are familiar, some of you might be new with this practice. This Tonglen means sending and receiving. Tong means to send, Len means to take or receive. It's something we used to do all the time, especially when we were doing the Lojong, because it's the main practice for Lojong mind training. Kind of a building block after, in my opinion, in, of metta, because metta is like the donging, is the sending, you know, may you be f happy, may you be free of fear, may you be free from harm, you know, all of those wonderful phrases, you can make up metta phrases, but it's really more of like the sending part of the tong and lening. <laughs> and then the, the tonglen is more of a Mahayana practice, so the next phase of development within Buddhism in India where compassion became very um, kind of more highlighted. It was always important. Um, and Donglen is really one of the classic meditative techniques used to help people cultivate greater capacity for feeling compassion. So the four measurables of love, which is metta, uh, compassion, karuna, equanimity is upeka or upeksha, and joy is mudita. The second one, compassion or karuna, thonglen is the common practice taught there. So that's what we just did tonight. And this classic arc of first with the self, then with the loved one, then with the neutral, then the so-called enemy, and then the world, of course, always ending with the world. <laughs> you can. Don't forget the world. <laughs> then that's a kind of classic arc. But if you're doing Tonglen on the go, you could do it for that jerk who just cut you off on the freeway. <laughs> you could do it for your boss or you could do it for anyone. You could just do it for one person or a group of people, politicians that you're hating on the TV or your spouse who just criticized you yet again about the way you don't pick up your clothes off the floor <laughs> or whatever. You know, can you can you train yourself to instead of you know hating on people, tonglen on them, like oh thank you annoying person. Yet another opportunity to practice dharma. Thank you, thank you. Remember we talked about that last time with patience. You know. Okay, so I'm just giving you time to think about any questions or comments you might have. Um, Feel free to unmute or raise your hand if you want to ask a verbal question, or you can chat in. Yeah, so Denise is saying it, it's it's difficult at first uh, to remember to focus just on one person. And then at the end, I can do this for more than one. Okay, good. Okay, got it. So I already answered the question about why one. Yeah. So if you know the one, you know the many, right, Denise? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say at um, Christmas dinner with my family there, there was suddenly someone who said something very 
pain filled. And I just felt myself automatically pulling it in like I would with somebody on a walk or something, hitting my heart and sending out love and doing that. And the whole atmosphere of the table changed probably because of what he said, but maybe the Tong Lin helped too. So I, just, I don't know why I wanted to say that, but I wanted to say that. So it's okay to do all of those things. Absolutely. And what you did, that's beautiful. That's intuitive, spontaneous Tong Lin. And I think it does change the feeling, if not just for you, probably in the fabric of the room, right? We, we are connected in that way. It's not woo-woo, as people like to say. I think it's really, it's important. Thank you. Yeah, those those shares are helpful. Okay, Jason, are there particular practices you can share about how to do Tonglen for someone with cancer? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just, uh, you would imagine them, you know, or if you're in their presence, which I have done Tonglen with my mother-in-law as she was dying. I was there by her bedside. She was unconscious. And, uh, you know, really on her last legs. But um, so when you're when you are with someone who is ill, or, you know, maybe even passing, or even just a kid with a high fever, you know, um, sit with them, you could hold their hand. Uh, We at Tara Mandala, Lama Tsultrim actually would guide us in a kind of a more um, Western style of Tonglen, where we're actually like, one person is lying down on the ground and we're all in dyad, so everybody's buddied up. And then uh, the second person, the buddy, is sitting near, you know, next to them and takes their hand. And we, you share in confidentiality, you know, the person who, I think it's like before we lie down, if we were in a group, we could even do this, but, you know, have a dyad and talk about like, okay, you know, right now I'm, I'm actually struggling with a dynamic with my mother or something, or I have chronic back pain, or, you know, I'd like to work, do Tonglen with that. Would, can we do Tonglen with that? So then you'd lie down, your buddy would hold your hand and they would practice. You would just receive and the person sitting and holding the hand would get to practice Tonglen in, in the space of the other, not just in the imaginary space. And it was very rich. It's very beautiful. Uh, people really enjoyed it and benefited from it. So if you were in the presence of somebody who was ill or had cancer, you could take their hand and do that if it's okay with them. But also if they're across the country or in another town or whatever, it's also just as potent to imagine them and imagine in either case the cancer as the smoke. And you're breathing it in, purifying it, cleansing it at the heart space, transforming it. And it's like you transform that energy of the cancer into nectar or into antidote, into medicine, and offer that to them with the out breath. See, this is why in Tonglen it's very important to understand the non self, the essential key Dharma teachings of non self, because as long as we're clinging, you know, reifying our separate sense of self, then we're more likely to feel like, oh, I've got to protect my territory over here and I'm not going to breathe anybody's cancer into my body, <laughs> you know. But as, as that kind of illusory separate sense of self loosens up through our Dharma practice, through contemplation and reading and study and meditation, then, um, then we start to uh, feel like we're not so solid, right? And so we're not, therefore we don't have to protect this ego like we're protecting territory. And then we can be more beneficial in the world. We can be like, there's no target here. Like shoot your arrow at me, fine, <laughs> you know? No ego, no target, no self, no problem. And so it, the, the Tonglen becomes more juicy and um, fun when we start to not worry so much about, oh my God, I'm taking on that thing. Because you're actually not. What you're doing is you're taking on the capacity to grow your heart, you know, your compassion heart. 
Yeah, No Self, No Problem. It's a book title for a, a wonderful teacher who lives here in the Bay Area named Anam Tupton. Anam Tupton, he wrote a book called No Self, No Problem. But I just, I, I haven't read the book. I just, I saw the title. I was like, I don't need to read the book. I just love the title. <laughs> it's a great title. Okay, I'm sure I could read the book too. And maybe it's a fine book. Okay, I see a hand raised. I think that's us or me two for one <laughs> two for one um i appreciate what you were just saying and it reminded me of this experience that i've been having when i do like tonglin or that idea of like oh bringing in like sadness or whatever usually it's particular sadness and being like this isn't like my sadness this is like everyone's like, this is the sadness that humans experience. And like me, just like everyone has this feeling. And like Tonglin kind of like, is like, oh yeah, sadness is just like this field of energy that I slash we just experience. And it just kind of comes and it just moves in like, whatever that is, it just moves in and you're just like, oh, somehow it just discharges like what you're saying, like no self, no problem. I don't experience it quite like that, but it's like, it's like, oh, it's like, oh, it's cold out or, oh, it's sad in right now, you know? And then the sad just kind of like does whatever it does, right? But like my, it does generate that, that um, distance from it. And so like in Tonglin really then is like that smoky vapor or whatever it is, is just being like open to that field. I don't know. I just, whatever, it reminded me of experiencing it that way when you were just talking. So I thought I'd share. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. It's like, instead of I suffer, there is suffering or I am sad. There is sadness here. There's something helpful about being able to have space between the, the identify the face plant with the feeling and actually like have some perspective and feel the universality of it. I, I appreciate that. I've had those experiences too, you know, sometimes a weeping and it's like, okay, this is not just my sadness. This is the sadness of the world, you know, it's kind of universal sadness. Sometimes we channel those things and we can help channel. We can help heal when we connect on that level. And the Tonglen helps us with that. That's one. Thank you, Pam, for presencing that. Claudia. Yeah, I uh, have a question. When you were talking about no ego, no problem, and last week when we were talking about patience, um, something caught my eye. It, there is a paragraph on, pa on page 113 where it says, when we are criticized by someone, our hearing faculty and consciousness all interact so that the statement provokes a strong feeling of displeasure. In any case, he goes about saying that we shouldn't feel the, the word personally. We, we shouldn't take it personally, but, but there's something here that says, if we had no ego clinging, there will be no one for the enemy to attack. So we should reflect how situations, and this is my, my question, if you could give an example. So we should reflect how situations of conflict are called for by our own past actions. This is on page 114. Right, okay, yeah, so, oh, here we are coming to karma again. <laughs> um, you know, I was talking to a Tibetan today about karma, actually, and he was saying, you know, amongst the, um, in the monasteries, because he was trained in a Tibetan monastery, karma is, but also within uh, great philosophical, you know, um, writings, some of the great teachers say that understanding or achieving enlightenment is easier than understanding the workings of karma i was like thank you that validates me and my um sometimes hardship of really 
coming to peace with or grappling with um, the teachings on karma. They're not easy to understand. And in fact, you know, even the great masters say we there's no way we can understand every cause for the effect that we're experiencing right now. And and yet also Padmasambhava says that wonderful quote, I think I've said here before, which is if you want to understand your past lives, look at your present or your past karmas, we could say, look at your present karma, your present situation. If you want to understand your future lives, um, look at your present karma. And so I think that's what this quote is talking about is that, you know, there's this, this uh, teaching in Dharma to um, maybe just, maybe this, this teaching helps people avoid blaming others for the circumstances that they're feeling although sometimes blaming or understanding is um is needed and important um but uh getting getting so wrapped up in like why am why was i born a woman in this life you know if i was raised in a even more patriarchal misogyny misogynist culture i would um sometimes karma can be used to hold people down and that is the distortion of karma so i don't think we should reach that passage in that way but it is a in a sense encouraging people to uh to say look you know maybe maybe i i've got this particular situation because it's a fruition of some past karma. Maybe, you know, maybe I stepped on a mountain of ants <laughs> and then, you know, I'm going to experience some form of getting squished in this life. Maybe it's a feeling of claustrophobia in a relationship, but, <laughs> you know, it could have stemmed from causing claustrophobia uh, on an anthill, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, but this is this classic Buddhist teaching on karma of cause and effect. And what one colleague on this call said is, look, I don't I try not to get too wrapped up in trying to understand the past. I just really look at my present, like how my, whatever causes led me to my particular circumstance right now. Um, what I know is that I can work with my current circumstances right now. I can't change the past. I may never really understand why. Uh, I am or what's happening right now but we have to be I think peel away any kind of overlay right and so that is I think a distortion now that's my side commentary Claudia I know maybe you weren't even looking fishing for that but that's something that I was thinking about actually today is the, the karma just means action. It, it means cause and effect, right? And so I think it's Newton's second or third law of motion. It's It seems to make sense, right? But having said that, it's the web of, of the interrelatedness of everything is, is almost too much for an individual to fathom fully. But what he's trying to say in that passage is, you know, if somebody's attacking you, this is this is this is a traditional interpretation is maybe, you know. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna say what this Tibetan colleague said today, which was somebody asked the Dalai Lama about karma at a teaching somewhere in Seattle many years ago. And they said, if somebody's standing right in front of me and pointing a gun at me, which is kind of like the scenario that you just read, what should I do? Should I let him shoot me or should I fight back? And the Dalai Lama said, fight, um, shoot him back if you have a gun, <laughs> assuming you have a gun, but make sure you have a rubber bullet that you're not shooting to kill. That was interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Oh, you know, so I guess that's my best stab at, at that. It's a good question, Claudia. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very um, deep karma. So anyway, how does that land with you? 
Any follow up? Thank you. Yeah. Still working on it, work in progress. But it was helpful to hear that these great philosoph Buddhist philosophers think that karma is harder to understand, really. It's really almost, you know, it's so complicated. I mean, especially if, if we've been born throughout countless eons. You know, this is just one of billions of lives that each of us have had. So if we exponentially increase the karma that we create in one life by billions, or countless lifetimes, it's, it could be that in another eon, on another, in another galaxy, on another planet, you and I were like, doing this, you know, and here we are again, <laughs> doing it again, or maybe we were dancing the tango, or <laughs> maybe you were teaching me, you know, at one point, we've all been each other's mothers, you could say we've all been each other's teachers, <laughs> students, right, more me mechanic, yeah, yeah, exa exactly, and the, the karma um, can be used in terms of the caste system and race issues in a really negative way. So no, that was never Buddha's intention. But it's just like even the teachings of Jesus, you know, distorted by humans who are hungry for power. So karma is certainly can fall prey to that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope I didn't just create more karma by talking about karma. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. We're all, everything is, everything we do creates karma. That's why it's, as we get older and, and, you know, more tired, <laughs> we need to think about being efficient. Um, if I say or do that, will it create more busy work for me? <laughs> more of a karmic web? Or should I maybe not say that or do that? And we have to choose. We choose wisely. Okay, more. Okay, when receiving the pain of my sister who suffers emotional pain, I began to weep. Just let it happen, which like, yes, good. Good, Roseanne, that's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, good, Denise, that's great. Okay. Yeah, in energy medicine, I always have asked permission of the person before healing work. Good. Yeah, it is okay to not ask in Tonglen, I assume. Yeah, it is. But you can. I mean, if you if you want to and you feel like it's okay, you know, if it's a, some, you know, you can ask. But it's not a core preliminary in the Tonglen. I've never heard it said in the oral or written teachings on Tonglen that you need to ask permission. So, but that doesn't mean you can't ask permission. Um, and just actually, you know, at, at the same time, this is in interesting because with the Tonglen, it, it's kind of a different angle. It's a different orientation than healing work. You know, it's a healing work that you, you're the healer and they're the sick person and you're trying to heal. Maybe you have certain tools that you can employ to help them. Tonglen, yeah, it's a tool, but it's very important when we're doing Tonglen not to have that stance, actually. I mean, you can sincerely want to heal someone, but it's also a very personal practice because you're working with the, um, with your, your healing just as much as you are working with their healing. And it's in, very important to not be attached to the fruit of your actions with Tonglen, you know, like I'm going to do Tonglen so that they you know, stop being a jerk, you know, like, like, that would be nice, but also watch the attachment to the outcome, and try to hold that kind of interdependent recognition that, you know, I'm doing this, but there's actually no me here, <laughs> there's no you inherently there, and there's no real inherent action of Tonglen, the action in between, you know, the threefold emptiness of self, other, and the action between the two. There's a quality of a light handedness and open palmness, um, a non attachment to the outcome that we bring to Tonglen. That usually, when I do more extensive teachings on Tonglen, I talk more explicitly about. 
but I didn't bring that up tonight. So I'm just wondering if maybe that can also come into play with this, um, this feeling of like permission or not asking permission. Um, yeah. Okay, so I want to uh, spend some time, uh, hopefully on all of these in the last 15 minutes, which probably isn't going to happen. They're all so fun. It's a short section on the next of the six perfections. So we're on the fourth, which is joyous effort, sundru in Tibetan. Sundru literally means like joyful effort or enthusiastic effort. It's basically effort, but with some joy mixed in, right? So it's not a dredge, drudgery. It's not, I have to meditate. <laughs> it's like, oh, let me meditate because I know it's good for me. I always feel happier after I meditate. Or maybe not, but I know it's good for me anyway, usually. So um, basically, in a nutshell, I'll just say with the first one, I won't read the whole thing, but Kangyur Rinpoche on page 120, 120 of On the Path to Enlightenment, it talks about three kinds of laziness. It's pretty, pretty intuitive. The first one is... <laughs> Let's all, you know, we can all join together if we want to, admitting that we might be succumbing to this. The people who are inextricably entangled in the affairs of this world. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> that if you want to, if you identify engrossed in those, overwhelmed by the bustle of mundane activities in society, we cling to dear ones, repudiate their adversaries, you know, blah, 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 blah. The eight mundane concerns go round and round, and we are wrapped up in those. And um, that is the first actual form of laziness, something that keeps us from applying enthusiastic effort towards our spiritual life and practice. Netflix, <laughs> sometimes mindless Netflix are just what the doctor ordered though so i'm not poo-pooing that but it's just all within reason all within balance all within moderation what i loved is the image that he has here on the last line which is saying that the people like this are like silkworms imprisoned in the cocoons of their own making i thought that was so good uh because so i always you know silk is a luxury <laughs> so it's like we're if we were silkworms we'd be wrapped up in our delicious silk cocoon but we're still kind of stuck and in prison in that and then the second one is being overpowered by laziness of discouragement telling uh, themselves that they are unable to accomplish even those achievements of dharma that are not that are only slightly difficult so we get destitute so we don't even do it right oh i'm not going to be good at that so i'm not even going to try it I just watched a TED talk by a colleague, a friend of mine, Christine Carter. I can't remember what it's titled, but it's talking exactly about this, like how to overcome perfectionism. Like a lot of people tend to just not try new things or do things because they know they're not, they think they're not going to be good at it. So th that was interesting to see this here. It's like, oh, that's number two on the laziness list. <laughs> It's a form of laziness. But what Christine, you could look up YouTube, Christine Carter. Uh, she gives a very nice talk. Uh, there are a few different talks by her about how to work with that and how to just, I can't even remember exactly what her remedy was, but it's kind of like common sense. Like you just, just do it for a minute. You know, go jogging, but just jog for a minute. <laughs> And then over time, the body's going to want to jog for a couple minutes. It'll, it'll feel good. So then it wants to do more. Wim Hof. I'm listening to Wim Hof method right now. How many people have gotten into Wim Hof? Cold water? Cold? Yeah. So he's talking about like cold, the cold. We, we're too comfy. You know, we're too warm all the time. Like our cardiovascular system needs to be challenged a bit. And so he talks about adding cold shower at the end of your warm shower every morning or night, whenever you do it. And he says, start off with 30 seconds. Then after a while, then maybe 10 days or so, I can't remember exactly. I just listened to this last night. Then do a minute. Then after a few days, build up to a minute and a half. Then two minutes of a cold shower. 
but the body starts craving it after a while. I haven't worked up till that long, but I do a cold shower and I do cold plunges. And it's true that the body wants it after a while, it craves that feeling. And so this is it. It's just, just do it for two seconds. <laughs> and then, oh, I can do that. Oh, it actually kind of feels good. Oh, it's even better than coffee, <laughs> sort of, or more effective than coffee. Okay, so then the third one is um, that the laziness saying they put themselves down with thoughts like, oh, but how could I ever do such things? To wallow in this kind of depression is to cut oneself off from the Dharma. So he's calling out these ways that we kind of, you know, sabotage ourselves in different gross to subtle forms of laziness, which I think are quite prevalent in our culture. Okay, I want to move on because there's some fun stuff too. The Buddha said on the top of page 121, I have shown you the methods leading to liberation, but know that liberation only depends on yourself. So Buddha's teachers, you know, even Buddha's, even Tara's, even Avalokiteshvara's can't take away your karma, can't make you enlightened. You, we have to do it ourselves. We have to purify our karmas. We have to remove the veils. We have to earn it. <laughs> All right. Milarepa, without expecting quick results, practice sincerely until your last breath. So slow and steady. You know the story of Milarepa, the last teaching he gave to one of his primary disciples, Gampopa. Have you heard this? So Gampopa lived with Milarepa in the mountains for many, many years, and then it finally became game time for Gampopa to set off on his way and teach Dharma. And as they were walking down the mountain together, Milarepa was walking him down, accompanying him, right before they said goodbye at the river where Gampopa was going to cross and keep going. Gampopa turned and said goodbye, and they said well, goodbye, and then he's walking away, and then a few moments later, Milarepa says, wait, I have one last teaching for you. And Gampopa turns and says, yes. And Milarepa turns around, pulls up his skirts, and shows him his bare ass. And he shows him the calluses on his bare butt. He's like, this is what you need to do for you to achieve liberation, right? Do your time on the seat. I love that story. Okay, so I really love this last passage. Maybe it reveals something about my sense of humor, but I think it's really funny, the image of it. Bilgo Kensei tells this story, an anecdote illustrating determination. One day at Samye Monastery, the great master Ma Rinchen Chok participated in a philosophical contest, a debate, with Gelwa Chuyang, a disciple of Padmasambhava, the great tantric Indian master. When Ma realized he had lost the debate, he said to himself, I will go to India to deepen my knowledge of the teachings. And rising immediately, he ran for the first few miles of his journey to India. Our desire to learn and practice the path should be as ardent as that. I mean, on the one level, I'm like, what an idiot, you know, <laughs> running. But then I'm like, no, it's so brilliant. His, his sundru, his joyous effort is so authentic, so much, so sincere, unhindered. Can you imagine doing that? You lose a debate and like without like telling your family or gathering your things or packing up a backpack, you, you rise and then run for the first few miles to India from Tibet, which is like months over the Himalayas. Is that funny to you too? I don't know. That image just, I chuckled for a while after reading that. That was so good. Now, don't let this stuff get you down. I mean, like, 
I'm never going to be as joyously effortful as that guy, but, but it's fun to think about, you know, it helps, helps get you up in the morning, helps get you on your cushion. All of these stories are meant to inspire us, not to make us feel depressed, <laughs> you know, or overwhelmed like those last two aspects of laziness can. Okay, Gyalwa Yongpa, Yang Gompa on 122. Gyalwa Yang Gompa says, as an old parchment that curls around itself, negative tendencies tend to come back. New habits are easily destroyed by circumstances. You will not cut through delusion in an instant. All you who consider yourselves great meditators, spend more time in meditation. I mean, each line is so good. I love the images. I'm always, I'm a stickler or like a lover of images, right? Natural metaphor. So just like an old parchment that curls around itself, negative tendencies tend to come back. I mean, that alone is just so cool. And then new habits are easily destroyed by circumstances. True. And then, of course, you will not cut through delusion in an instant. Right. What was I thinking? <laughs> and then this one. All you who consider yourselves great meditators spend more time in meditation. It's like, especially those of you who think you're good at meditating. Ha ha. Sit that ass down and get those calluses. Especially those people because remember what we said last time as long as you're thinking i am meditating you're not meditating <laughs> you know that's novice behavior like real meditation is just relaxed letting yourself be as you are uncontrived unforced matcha ah like we say right pamela and mace in the chud practice matcha ah it means rest unfabricated in the natural state. So if you wonder how good you are in meditation, just ask yourself, can I rest in do I can I rest in a naturalness? A matcha ah, a natural state of awe. So okay, the last one from Milarepa at the in the he says, at the beginning, nothing comes. In the middle, nothing stays. In the end, nothing goes. What is he talking about? So down below, the little asterisk is a nice explanation of this. Milarepa is saying here that at the beginning of spiritual practice, nothing seems to change in our way of being, right? It seems like it's going to take forever to feel the benefit of our practice sometimes. But then after some time, change, changes do occur, but they're not stable. And then finally, when our practice becomes stable and deep, our inner peace, wisdom, and other spiritual qualities are no longer subject to fluctuations. So in the end, nothing goes. I thought that was pretty cool. Any questions, comments? Can I say something? It's Lindsay. Yes. Hi. Hi. I, I love those three um, stories in a row because when you're talking about getting up and running to India, I totally identify with that kind of energy where I have these kind of like, I call them my golden retriever bursts where I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm going to do the thing. And like, <laughs> I've gotten pretty... <laughs> cynical with myself about that actually because I know from experience that it's actually when I'm sort of like calmly drawn to sit again and again and it becomes just habitual and more of a quiet desire that that's when it's like really taking versus those like bursts but it, it was actually really helpful it makes me feel listening to the second part about um you know, habits will curl back on you and it's not going to happen at once. 
it made me just feel like, okay, I actually can honor the golden retriever <laughs> burst of energy yeah. and, and not sort of be super cynical about it, but just be like, okay, that's good. And you know, so I don't have to like disavow that or think it's like fake yeah. or, um, yeah. um, but, but use it in conjunction with the more sort of like slow, stable, we don't have to run to India tonight energy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Good. Yeah, like one thing that helps, I love what you just said. I mean, that's fabulous. I I, I love that. And yeah, you can channel that golden retriever. I mean, how, I wish I had more of that. I think it's great. And use it when the time is right. You know, one thing that helped me, one, uh, something a teacher of mine used to say is with stuff like that it's helpful to say a part of me you know is a golden retriever and then and then a part of me is slow and steady like a tortoise or whatever you know like it's not all of you right not all of you Lindsay, is is a golden retriever but there's times when that could be used and channeled in a good way i also yeah. want to clarify that it's not like i'm getting a lot done it's just the impulse the golden yeah. retriever impulse and energy is there it's not that I yeah. necessarily follow through on it but yeah 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 I know that I know that. I was saying to my dad just the other day I was like yeah I got good at following through on things or like finishing what I started because I'm writing this book and I told him I was admitting to him that I'm kind of over it <laughs> you know like, he's like yeah it's easy to start stuff but I'm also loving writing my book but I'm sure anybody who's written a book probably knows that feeling of like oh man I've got to finish this as he's like, yeah, it's easy to start things, not so easy to finish things. And I was like, yeah, I, I used to not be good at finishing things, but I kind of got better at it over hitting around 27 when I really hit my stride with like Dharma because I found my passion. But before then it was more like golden, maybe not like golden retriever, but just hard to see things through, you know, as a youth. So the, 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 the marathon stamina is also really good. So, all right. I feel like I'm talking a lot. In one minute, who wants to say something? <laughs> one minute to wax poetic, no pressure. Something. Right on, Walt. Bravo, you nailed it. I received the darshan. <laughs> Ocean plunges. <laughs> like Sally's comment. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Good. Well, so Eve will be with you next week. There's the Donna link. Please, every little, any little, every little thing you can do is magic and helpful 